Church on the Rise would like to welcome you to the Ministry of the Word. We pray that it will help you find the will of God more clearly in your life. Thank you. I feel like home. Might become a Calandrian. It's got a nice beach here. Definitely nice weather. Just have to go centre. I've got a bit of OCD. That's better. <laughs> Well, uh, privilege as always to think that coming into a church and speaking was the last thing that was ever in my mind that I would ever do on the face of the planet. I thought church was for good people. Not Christians, good people. I thought good people go to church. That's all I thought. I looked at the church and I thought that's where good people go. That's where I don't belong. Thank you, Pastor Rod and Rhonda. Uh, it's an honour for me to be able to share in your church. Thank you for opening your door. Thank you for giving me an opportunity. And I hope today that I can be a blessing in your house. One thing I want to say about your house is, even on the way here, this place is like a gym. I thought, I've never actually had a word like that before for a church. It's like a gym where everyone's working out. People are working out their salvation, number one, but also doing work in the community. I see a two-pronged approach. I see what God is doing in here is activating out there. And I see that uh, even though there might be a bit of blood, sweat and tears along the way, because that's what happens when you usually work out, isn't it? You know what a baked bean? No? So I just want to encourage you guys, and also seeing your arms lifted up. You're lifting up the next generation. You're rising up the next generation saying, Lord, I know what we've done and I know what we've achieved and I know there's still more to do, but I want to see the next generation raised up and released. And the Father has heard the cry of your heart and he knows the desire of your heart. And I also wanted to affirm to you as well, there's a scripture in the Bible that says, commit your plans to the Lord. And I felt that's a prophetic word for this house. You've committed your plans to the Lord, and the Lord's saying they're going to succeed. Amen? Is that cool? Cool? That's a nice appetizer, wasn't it? Are you excited about that? That's awesome. Well, I am half, maybe quarter, I'm not sure. My nana's Aboriginal, and my pop's German. And voila, a la butter peanut butter sandwiches. Here's me. I was born in a town called Broken Hill, uh, not Broken Hill, Wilkenya. Who's heard of Wilkenya? Well, it's not in South Africa, just for people that don't know anything about Australia. It's on the outback of New South Wales. I was born there, and I was brought up most of my life in Broken Hill, and my family were country music singers. Don't hold that against me. <laughs> It's taken me years to get over it. <laughs> I apologise for any country music lovers in here, but for me, um, I had a lot of fun anyway, you know what I mean? Like, we used to travel a lot. We used to go out there to Tamworth, and they used to do the festivals up there. Uh, we used to have a little pub called uh, Silverton, just outside of Broken Hill, where the camels drunk beer, and uh, everyone was gigging on and partying on and all that sort of stuff. You know, my, my upbringing was uh, very unusual, maybe to some of you here, but it might be familiar to some of you here as well. Um, I wasn't brought up in a very structured family, um, completely unstructured. You know, the first time that I ever started learning about life was actually when I started reading the Bible. You know, my mum never taught me right or wrong, ever. She'd have a smoke in her mouth and say to me, son, don't you ever smoke. She'd come home maggoty drunk. And say, don't you ever drink. So there was no sense of morale. There was no moral ethics. And most of the time, I didn't even know where my mum was. Didn't know my father. My father was actually a man of the land. He was out in properties. My uh, father's side are quite well off, business people. But my mother's side were complete opposite. There, there wasn't a time in my life, I don't think, where I was taught that it was good to 
get a job and be responsible. Maybe when I was older in life, but not when I was growing up. See, I was brought up around doll bludgers. Hello? You know what doll bludgers do? They're professional bludgers. (laughs) So I had my profession. And it was to get benefits for what I believed. It was a reward for doing nothing. (laughs) And I expected the Centrelink system to pay me. And I used to get so frustrated if they didn't. As though I worked so hard at being a doll bludger. (laughs) Come on, loosen up a bit, it's all right. (laughs) See, I lived in uh, a place called Ningen when I was about eight years old. And uh, I started playing rugby league. And I was really good at playing rugby league. I was very gifted at it. They had spectators come down from Sydney and uh, they actually selected me. And they said to my mother that we think it's in your best interest to get your son to Sydney. We want to train him up in the school squad. We want to train him up. We believe that he's going to be a future star. My mum said no. And unfortunately, I had to stay home with her uh, with you know, massive uh, binge drinking issues at home. Uh, she met a guy who was my stepfather. He was in and out of prison and boys' homes most of his life. And it was quite violent, extremely violent. And so that wasn't just sort of the only violent side of my family. I also had my nana who remarried. And uh, he was a psychopath. He wasn't your ordinary sort of individual. For example, we're at Gerald M. Bone Pub, just outside of Ningen. And we had a, a, a hall there for all the kids. And it was for free, the pool table. Now, cause, because my nana remarried, she had three other children, so I had an uncle who was younger than me. I know, it's a twisted story. Wait, it gets better. <laughs> it gets so much better. Yeah, I'm just warming up. And um, I remember I went, I grabbed the pool cue, and I thought, oh, I'm just going to have a shot on the pool table. And I did. And he didn't want me to play. So he started whinging. I said, oh, come on, man, just give us a shot on the pool table. Well, it, it affected him so much, he went into the bar, which that's where my nana's husband was, and must have told his father. All I remember was he come through the door, went to the pool uh, cue, cue rack and grabbed the pool cue off the actual rack and come at me. Now, understand this, I was nine years old, this tall. And he came at me ferociously and smashed me to pieces with a pool cue when I was nine years old. All right? And so I had sort of continual issues like this. For example, my stepfather made me stand there for putting an extra teaspoon of sugar in me Milo. Now, you usually go, oh, yeah, you know, you get adorable with your little kids, you know what I mean? Oh, you put extra in, you know what I mean? Big deal. Well, he grabbed me, turned me around and just strapped me and strapped me and strapped me, flogged me to pieces from behind to the point I had scabs on my legs just for putting an extra teaspoon of sugar in my Milo. Right? And then my pop, not my real pop, but this other guy that married my nana, would tie us down to a trampoline with ropes ankle to ankle so if we moved it would rub our ankles remember once he told us to stand up you know the uh, the gauze mesh fences he told us to stand up as high as we could on tippy toes and if we moved he had a steel rod a knife sharpener and he threatened to flog us if we moved one bit as a as a form of discipline and I remember my cousin, he started swearing and just started losing it. And so he just went out on him and just started smashing him with this steel rod. And um, lucky, oh, hey, hey, I got out that day, man. <laughs> that was like the best day I could ever be alive. And um, at a young age, I was sexually abused, mentally abused, verbally abused, physically abused. Sexually abused by people in my family, extended family. Sexually abused by people outside of my family because I was left at home. I was left with these people that I didn't even know. Mentally abused because my uncle had bipolar and used to walk around telling me about his ace world and that his brother lived inside of him, spinning out, going AWOL, wouldn't sleep for days. And he was my role model. He was the one that I looked up to. remember once uh, he was cutting a roast up and I thought, I'm going to help Uncle Martin. I'm going to help him. I'm going to cut... The roast while he's busy doing something else. And I thought I was doing him a (laughs) favour. 
<laughs> and next minute I come out and I obviously um, realised that he was really upset that I was cutting his meat. I think I was about 11. And uh, he grabbed me up against the cupboard off my, off my feet and chucked me to the ground and ordered me up to fight him. You know, and I was just around this all the time. I remember even at the age of 12, I think I was in the caravan, I was inhaling aerosol cans and uh, left my body when I was about 12 years old. And uh, I actually went outside of my body and I see myself sitting in the caravan. How close I was to death so many times has just got me absolutely flabbergasted. I'm blown away because I shouldn't be here today. There is no possible way that I should be here today unless it was from the providence and the predestination of the Lord upon my life. I should not be here. You know, I thought, oh, it's embarrassing. I don't want to tell people what my past was like, but hey, who cares? Who cares what people think about my past? What matters is that Jesus Christ gets the glory. I used to go from motorbike to motorbike, lawnmower to lawnmower, inhaling petrol. I hated life so much, I didn't care what I'd done, I'll do it. Just to escape reality. Just to numb the pain that I didn't seem to be able to cope with and survive with. Aerosol cans, I tried nitro gas bottles, petrol, marijuana, hash, LSD, prolidones, endones, valium, tamazepam, serapax, mogadons, cogentin, fluffy mixile injections, hyperparadol injections, modicate injections, valium injections. Largactyl, Melaril, I was on antipsychotic drugs, I was on antidepressants. I hated my life that much at the age of 16. They sent me to the second biggest mental institution in Orange when I was 16 years old because they didn't know what to do with me. I wanted to die so bad, I attempted it. Probably, who knows, could have been 25 to at least 50 times I attempted suicide. They sent me to the mental institution because they could not get me off taking drugs. I'd go to the doctor and I'd get my own script for Valium. Who's, had, who's heard of Valium? Well, I wouldn't just take 50 in one hit. Mum would be uh, coming into the room. I'm laid out on the floor, look like I'm dead. Ambulance comes and said, we don't even understand how this young man is still alive. He's got the faintest pulse because I just dropped 100 Valium. Then I'd get up and go to the doctor myself and go and get another 25 sleeping tablets of tamazepans. Then I've got a mate in Adelaide who ripped off a chemist. Next thing you know, I've got Rohypnol. And I'm dropping them like lollies. <laughs> Come on. You can't tell me God's not good. People falling through the door, falling through the window. Mum's just, she didn't know what to do. My own friends who were drug addicts were afraid for my life. Because they knew how serious I was from not wanting to live it. Been on MDMA crystals, which is pure ecstasy, fantasy, ecstasy, cocaine, ice, speed, you name it, taking it, alcohol. And I wasn't just the type of guy to just take little doses. <laughs> it had to be to the extreme. It had to be full hog. The pain inside of me was so intense. The day that my mum said that she loved me, I went into the kitchen and sharpened up a knife for two minutes. A big round knife like that. I sharpened it up on the knife sharpener for two minutes looking at the knife. I've got a big scar on my arm here because I nearly cut halfway through my arm with a knife. Because the internal pain was so intense and I couldn't get it out. And I didn't know what to do with it. I didn't even know where to take it. I've had drug and alcohol counsellors, been into mental institution, mental wards, been to rehabs, and no one seemed to be able to fix up this unbearable feeling on the inside of me. I'd go out the front yard on the metal fences and hack my arms down, smash them down on metal fences and rip and shred my arms up because I couldn't get rid of the pain. And I didn't even care no more. You know, I remember me mate, you know, he, he, he back answered me on the street one day. I just didn't care. Car's driving past, put a knife up to his throat. Said, you ever back answer me again, I'll slice your throat open. I've sat there and threatened. I won't even get graphic, but I've, I've threatened to do some very nasty, horrible things to people. 
used to drive around with a windscreen knocked out of the front car. Come on, windscreen knocked out. You know, here's me, got my front foot out in the bonnet, <laughs> cruising around all hours at night. Oh, it was sport, man. It was fun. Just jump out of the car and just start smashing people. <laughs> I didn't care. For me, it was fun. And why would I expect anything different from myself outside of Christ? See, by nature, I'm selfish. By nature, I done what I wanted, when I wanted, and how I wanted. <laughs> because that's what people done to me, so why couldn't I do it to others? And I've felt the terrifying fear and the feelings of trepidation. I've seen my stepfather smash my mum's face in, in front of me. Her screaming out with blood-curdling screams, begging him to stop. And as a little boy, I couldn't do a thing about it. I was so terrified. This guy hid up in the roof for a week, waiting, watching, and paranoid because he thought mum was playing up on him. The only way that we found out that he'd come up through the manhole was because there was a stench coming out of the roof. And he jumped down through the manhole and, and we had a baseball bat there. We we're ready to go. But he was already in the house. <laughs> and to see a, a knife up to my mum's throat as a little boy. Him telling her he was going to kill her and I couldn't do nothing about that. I know what it's like to feel powerless. I know what it's like to feel helpless. I know what it's like to feel hopeless. I know what it's like to have darkness in your life to the point you can feel it and you can smell it and you can see it and you can sense it. Remember one night, you know, we woke up and there's flames flickering through the, winds, the, the uh, windows of our house. He's torched the car in the front yard. All the streets cut off. Ambulances and cops down one of the main streets where I lived. Feeling embarrassed and ashamed. Going to friends' houses and begging for food. I know what shame feels like. And I'm not minimising if you feel shame here. I know how painful it is. And I know how painful it is to live with. And I know that it's not an automatic process just because you give your heart to Jesus. It takes time. It takes time to renew your mind. It takes time to trust the Lord. How could I trust the Lord if I couldn't trust anyone that I could see? Everyone that I knew abused me. I used to roam the streets at night by myself. Like a wolf, like a werewolf of the night, just jumping through people's windows and knocking on doors and making them stay up all night and talk to me. See, here today, you had a choice, right? <laughs> Pastor right had a choice. It's like, it's not like I'm forcing him to listen to me, eh? He invited me to listen. <laughs> he invited me. He's like, hey, I want to listen. Well, back in that day, they had to listen. <laughs> I was sitting around in circles and I'd talk for hours and hours and hours and hours, high as a kite. Terrified, they're sitting there waiting for me to stop talking. So, and oh, just so Mark would stop and they could maybe escape. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember uh, I was on speed, which is amphetamines, for about three days. Uh, my step uncle was a dealer. Most of my family are junkies, drug addicts, alcoholics. I can't think of one that's not. It's like, what could I do with my life? Is this okay? I remember I was very high, extremely high, and I uh, had all this stolen stuff. I don't know, they, they used to have video, you know, the, the old... Was it VCV, whatever it's called, you know, the old video square, big rectangle things, not these little DVD things. Yeah, video thing. They, they just had the video and you slap that in and there was no DVD players back then. But anyway, I ripped off all this stuff and I went around to Stiller's house and 
and uh, they had this really strong heroin that was in cap form. And uh, I said, give me one of those caps. And they said, it's really strong, Mark, be careful. I said, I don't care. I took one. It made me feel normal. I started abusing the person that gave it to me. And then I said, have the rest of the stolen stuff. I want another one. Little did I know that I was on my deathbed that night. All I remember is power spewing at the bar. And this lady was sitting there stroking me when I woke up. And, and, and she, she nearly started crying. She said, I've been here all night with you. I thought you were dead. I woke up. I walked out and I thought, I'm going to get a bong. Who knows what a bong is? I'm going to have a chill. That's all I thought. I didn't care. <laughs> it's not like, oh, I nearly died. It's like, say what? <laughs> I just kept going and doing what I was doing. I walked down the street right and how's this? Here it is. My ex years ago was a Christian. And as I was walking down the street, she was visiting from Sydney because they moved away from Broken Hill. And she jumped out of the car and I was in a bit of a daze and she jumped out swinging arms. Oh, Mark, oh, Mark, oh, come to church, come to church. And I'm like, no, nah, I'm not going to church. I thought she was trying to, I thought she was still keen. <laughs> so for a moment I'm thinking, where are you going? And next minute she wanted me to go to church and I'm like, no. I went, nah, I'm not going to church. Went home, right? I went to sleep and I woke up. And as I woke up, it sounded like my voice and it kept echoing through me. And it was saying, Mark, Ellie asked you to go to church. And it didn't stop once. Mark, Ellie asked you to go to church. And it was coming so fast and hard that I couldn't shut it off. And I couldn't shut it up. So I started getting the sweats and I'm thinking, hang on, I've got tracks. I'm going to have to go and get a long sleeve shirt. Here's me, skinhead, had a ponytail. I thought I was Tom Poe, the uh, professional Muay Thai kickboxer of that movie. Who's seen that? Only older people would know. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and so I thought, okay. And where I OD'd on the heroin, the church was right across the road. And I walked up to the church and I seen old Bob and Mary. Hey, Bob, hello, Mary. And I'm like, there is no way on the face of this planet that I'm going in there. <laughs> hey? I look like a gypsy with a mortgage. <laughs> I was sitting there sweating like hell. <laughs> and, uh, and I thought, okay, this is, getting, this is getting really bad. I was starting to get sweat up and... and uh, <laughs> I yelled out to the old people. I said, Oi! I said, If Ellie's in there, tell her Mark's across the road. Oh, okay, love, no worries. And they up, up, mosey up the hill to the church. <laughs> Next minute, I'm just about to do the Harold Holt, right? I'm going to me some green and I'm out of here. <laughs> How's this? Just as I was about to leg it. Mark, Mark! Here's Ellie coming down the driveway. And I'm thinking, Oh, no. That was my first time ever in church. And I walked in, and I must admit, like, I'm just going to say it as it is. Let's just call a spade a spade. I walked in, people lifting their hands and singing, and I'm thinking, what are these weirdos doing, mate? Like, lifting their hands, what are they singing to? And I'm just looking around like this. Next thing you know, it's like time for the altar call, and they drag me down the front. So much for having the choice to give me out to Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> hey? Jesus doesn't force you, but people will. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I go down the front and I said, okay, Lord, if you're real, done the sinner's prayer. And, you know, he was real. He was real. He, he, I had something tangible happen. But, um, all right. but the first time I ever gave my heart to Jesus was in the gym. Okay, let me tell you my introduction to the Bible. <laughs> who, wants, who wants to hear a good story? All right. When I was taking drugs, my step-uncle was on the speed. And he invited me around, and we, we were high, we had a good old chat, chin wag, we're sitting there talking, la, 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 la. Next minute, he flicks open his Bible. Now, you've got to understand, we're high on drugs. He flicks open his Bible like, let's get into it. <laughs> I'm like, why not? <laughs> let's talk about anything and everything. 
Well, I wasn't against God at the time. I thought, well, I'm in a good mood. Well, we could have a chat about anything if you want. And he started flicking the page and licking his finger and he was getting right into it. I don't even remember what he said. Anyway, so a couple of days after, a month, I don't even know what it was, but basically uh, he opened up a gym in the local area. And uh, I thought, oh, I'm going to suss out the new gym in town because there wasn't many gyms back then. YMCA, you know, they, they had all the gym, they had all the netball. But this was a new thing in Broken Hill. This is like, whoa, a new gym is opening. So I, I rock up thinking, okay, I've noticed a few dealers there and people that are on the drugs. I knew them from the town. And how's this? I walk in and uh, here's this step uncle of mine the one that was flicking the pages, he looks like he's glowing, he looks like he's high, he looks like he's excited. And I'm thinking, oh, mate, I'm in today. Next minute he goes, Mark, come up back office. And I'm like, yeah, sweet. So we go back up in the back office, right? Oh, he sits back in his little nice little office chair, nice little leather chair there. He sits back, opens up his Bible again, says, Mark, me and you have had a very similar future, like past, you know. I understand you, blah, blah, blah. And I thought, mate, get out of my face. I don't want to listen to this crap, right? And how's this? He walked out of the room. Another guy walked in. His name was Judd. He sat down at the table. And I reckon I waffled on for at least 45 minutes straight. You reckon I can talk now? You should have seen me back then, mate. And I just kept talking and talking. He's just listening at the table. And this atmosphere came so strong into the room. He leaned over the table and said, Mark? He said, do you know Jesus? Jesus? I went, no. Nah. <laughs> goes, would you like to meet him? I went, give it a go. That's exactly how I said it. And I closed my eyes and I remember giving my heart to Jesus and believing that he was the son of God and believing that if he gave me of my sins and I confessed and believed that he was rose from the dead. And I'm telling you, it was like a blindfold was over my eyes. And I went out of there praising God. I was so high, man. I thought I was on the cocaine, mate. I was just pumping. I got on the deadly treadly. He knows what that is. That's a push bike for the youngsters. I hop on the deadly treadly. I'm cruising home so excited that Jesus is real. Come in the door thinking everyone's going to be excited about it. And I tell mum, I said, mum, I said, Jesus is real. He's real. He's real. And she goes, get out of my effing face. You're off your face on drugs. And next minute, I wanted to make men's with my sister, and she just got back with a boyfriend. I said, Sandra, just, just tell me that you love me. Come on, let's just... I had so much love in me. I just met Jesus, man. All right? And she's like, get out of my effing room, blah, blah, blah. Boyfriend jumped in. Here we go. Straight after I gave my heart to Jesus. Lift him up off the, off the ground by the throat. <laughs> Threatened to kill him. <laughs> and then I put him down and smashed the uh, door in. There was a glass door in my sister's room. Smashed that in. Next thing you got a good big chunk in my hand. The day I gave my heart to Jesus. <laughs> So I'm down in the hospital. <laughs> and the guy that rocked up to the hospital was the guy that led me to Jesus that day. And he took me into his own house. He sent me to a rehab. Obviously because I thought, oh, I can help it. <laughs> you need more help, son. <laughs> so he sent me to rehab, right? So I go to rehab and go back. Long story short, I remember people tried to get me to go to church. They tried to get me to go to Bible study groups and whatever it was, right? But one day, how's this? The same uncle. This is the weirdest thing, man. The same guy that was off his face on drugs, the same guy that wasn't on drugs and tried to preach to me was the same guy that went back on drugs and he went to Sydney with the same family. So they said to me, they said, Mark, I've had enough of you. You know, Go and talk to Johnny. Johnny was at the sink washing the dishes, right? And I go up to Johnny because I know him. He's just a step uncle. Having a chat. He turns around and he goes, Mark? He said, John 3.3. 3. He said, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again. He said, John 3, 5, he said, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he's born of water and spirit. He said, John 3, 16, he said, God so loved this world that he gave his one and only son. Whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. He said, he didn't come into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. And I went, who's ever seen that special K ad? You know, she's sitting at the table and it's like, oh, right, I'll have what he's having. You, you seen that ad? Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> I had this moment, this epiphany. I was sitting there going, I want what that guy's got. And I rode home on the push bike again, early stages. And I thought it was the Book of Palms. (laughs) 
Now you've got to understand something. By the age of 19, I was in seven drug-induced comas. The doctor said if I was to come out of the coma, I would be a permanent vegetable. I left school at an early age. I couldn't read properly. And I flick open the book of Palms. Chapter 72, verse 14. And I have an encounter that changed my life forever. If I stood up in front of your face, you would feel me staring at you. And that's exactly what happened this day. I didn't know biblical hermeneutics, homiletics, how to deliver it, how to interpret it. I didn't even know what the Bible said. And I hit Psalms chapter 72, verse 14. And I had a person stare at me through the Bible. And he said directly to me through my being, like he was staring directly at me. He said, I'm going to rescue you from oppression, violence and fraud. Because your blood is precious in my sight. And it smashed me like a ton of bricks. And no one ever from that point onwards told me to read the Bible. And God has restored my mind. He's restored my life. Now he's given me back a life more than what I expected. That's the testimony. And you thought, you, you thought, I smashed the drugs. I smashed this thing harder. Just as hard as I went for the drugs, now I abandon myself for this. <laughs> he spoke to me personally. It wasn't like, oh, that just jumped off the page. It wasn't like that. It was a person. He spoke to me. Eyeball to eyeball spoke into my being directly at me. And I must admit, the journey has been tough. The journey has been up and down. The journey hasn't been what I expected it to be. I thought when you give your heart to Jesus, it's just going to be high. It's just going to be cool. It's going to be fun. It's going to be exciting. But along the journey, you realize that you've just been commissioned into the army. And the battleship's waiting at the port. I thought it was just meek and mild Jesus and I thought it was just going to be all good and I'd go to church and get my life together. No, it's not like that. The reality is it's a good fight of faith. And I'll finish with this as far as my story and I'll get into a few scriptures and wrap it up. Don't ever backslide, ever. You may be young here today and you might think church is boring. Or you might think, I've done church before, I've tried it, and it doesn't seem to work for me. You might be feeling like you don't understand it, you don't fit in. Guess what? That's your insecurity, it's not God. And the day that you realize that your insecurity is stopping you from being joined and united and planted to flourish, nothing is ever going to change. The first sign of insanity is doing the same thing and expecting different results. So if you're going to see different results, do different things. And I had to do different things. Warts and all. Rock up, Mark Johnson, here I am. Feeling like a shark out of water. <laughs> Feeling like, man, I don't get this. But the Lord did not give up on me. The Lord continued to work on me. And the reason I say don't you ever leave church is because I did. I picked up a gambling addiction at the age of 32 and I got on ice and I lost all my possessions and I ended up with nothing in Madura at my nana's house. And because the addiction got so strong, I took as much as I could because I thought I'm going to fry myself so hard that if I was to ever come back to Jesus, I'm going to give him 110%. Little did I know that I'd be in the city circling shops to do arm robs. I had a hooded jumper and I turned it back to front and put it over my face and cut the eyes and the mouth out and I was on the street with a hammer. And I ended up back where I came from and I'm sitting at a table talking about how we're going to take someone hostage and make them cook methamphetamines for us. 
and talking about plans to go and do home invasions, to do some debt collecting for some money that was owed to us. I had these unforeseen divine strategies from hell coming towards me that wanted to take me out completely. I remember a friend of mine come to me, he was owed more money than me, but he said, I've got a plan, I've got the balaclavas, I've got the guns, this is what we're going to do, we're going to pick them up, we're going to put them in body bags, we're going to take them out, we're going to blow their heads off and we're going to put them down holes. And that's the last time I felt in that darkness that the Lord was impressing upon my heart. He said, Mark, do not hurt people. And it's the only reason I didn't go ahead with what I was about to do. And little did I know that my mum was praying for me. <laughs> little did I know, I, was, I, just, I just went home, right, and I'm sitting in the lounge room, laying back. Just looked like something that the cat just chewed up and spat out, right? And I'm just laying there on this mattress in the lounge room, thinking about how I'm going to rip off my uh, sister's PlayStation. Just more drugs. And my mum came and knelt before me with this gentleness and this love in her eyes that I've never seen in my life. And she said, son, will you change your life? And a video clip before my mind of, I've got a 14-year-old daughter. I've never been married, but I've got a little girl. And my daughter went through my mind, and so did my mother. She had phone calls from Sydney saying that basically the bikers wanted to shoot me and stuff was going on. She was, she was going into her own deathbed as well. And I went to uh, the Gold Coast, 2011. I entered Transformation International Ministries on the Gold Coast, which is a rehabilitation discipleship program. I finished the program in one year and three weeks. Then I became a supervisor for six months after that. Then I went and lived with my brother and done an apprenticeship with tiling, like an express little thing, you know what I mean? Because he was a good tiler and he just sort of gave me little hot tips. And so I got trained up really quick, but I hated tiling. <laughs> I thought, I'm going to make a good career here. Got a great family, you know, things for the future and all this. And I thought, no, I can't stand it. So I went back to ministry. I've been working in ministry for four and a half years, working with madams and prostitutes and armed robbers and people in maximum security prison and people that have come from good lifestyles and backslidden Christians. You know, most of the people that go to these rehabilitations are not the ones that don't know Christ. It's the ones that have turned away from Christ. It's the ones that have lost their marriage. It's the ones that have had broken relationships. And the Lord restored me. And now I went overseas with Tim Hall. He invited me over there to Papua New Guinea. And I told my story in front of like ten to 15,000 people. The power of God was there. One guy in the flipping train station. I don't know if they had trains, whatever it was, airport. He's, he's got this big bag of dope and he gets so convicted because he hears me over the uh, radio. He gets so convicted he comes to the crusade and gives his heart to Jesus. I've seen deaf ears and blind eyes and people walk out of wheelchairs. I've seen cancer melt out of people's bodies. Come on, I've seen legs grow out. Let me tell you, if you're sitting here today and you're over church, guess what? Get on to Christ, get so addicted to Him and so passionate about Him and so hungry for Him that nothing of this world will grab a hold of you anymore. Psalms chapter 3 verse 8 says, Salvation belongs to the Lord. Whew. Your blessing is upon your people. There's no blessing out there. Salvation belongs to Him. You might be thinking today, well, why is this world so evil? Well, I was evil. I was wicked. That's why Psalms chapter 5 verse 4 says, You are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness, nor does evil dwell with you. You might be feeling like there's been some unjust things that have taken place in your life. It's like, God, why, doesn't, why don't you come with justice? And why don't you sort out this matter? But Psalms chapter 7 verse 11 says, God is a just judge. God is angry at the wicked every day. Let me give you a reality check. Psalms chapter 9 verse 17 says that the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Psalms chapter 10 verse 4 says that the wicked in his proud countenance does not seek God. God is in none of his thoughts. Verse 11 says he has said in his heart God has forgotten. He hides his face. He will never see. And in verse 13, it says, Why do the wicked renounce God? He has said in his heart, He will not require an account. 
But I want to say to you today, the Father in heaven is going to require an account of your life. Do not play games with the gospel. Do not play games with Jesus. It says in Romans chapter 2, verse 5, but, but, but because of your hardness and your impenitent heart, you're treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Verse 6 says, who will render to each one according to his deeds. It even says in verse 8, but to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath. Verse 9 says, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that does evil. Come on, man. The good news is this. In Romans chapter 5, come on, verse 6 to 8. He says, for when we were still without strength, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But verse 8 is this. But God demonstrated His own love towards us in this, that while we're filthy, dirty, rotten, putrid sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't die when we are at our best. He didn't die when we got it right. He didn't die when we were self-righteous. He died when we were a putrid, rotten, filthy, dirty, rotten sinner. Come on. That is the good news of the Gospel. Romans chapter 1 verse 20 says, right, for since the creation of the world, if you're sitting here today saying, well, I can't see God. It says, for since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that we are without excuse. That word excuse means we don't even have an answer. Because in verse 21, it says, because although they knew God, not a relationship, but they knew about Him, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were they thankful, be became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. They professed to be wise and they become fools. And they exchanged worship and then they give it, given over to the lust of their hearts and then they exchanged the worship in verse 25. And then they get given over to lesbianism in 26. and 27, they get given over to homosexuality. And even as they did not like to retain God in the knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. You may be here today and you might fit in the category of Romans chapter 1 verse 29, being filled with all wickedness, unrighteousness and wickedness, sexual immorality. Come on. You might be full of murder and deceit. You might be full of trickery and lies and scheming. But I want to say something to you today. God so loved you that He gave His one and only Son. <laughs> that if you believe in Him today, you have everlasting life. He didn't come into the world to condemn the world. Come on. He didn't come to condemn you, but you're condemned if you don't believe. In other words, you're holding on to your sin. God's not holding it against you. <laughs> hey? And just to finish off with this, for the self-righteous crowd, well, I'm not like those out there. The Bible says that in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, it says, if you, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, it says you shall be saved. What do you mean? They just believe and they're saved? Yes, they're saved. And I just want to bring a home reality truth to all of us here. Romans chapter 3, verse 10 says, There is none, I'll give you the news flash. There is none that is righteous, no, not one. Verse 11 says, There's none that understands. There is none that seeks after God. They've all, not some, they've all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. Guess what? There is none that does good, no, not one. And Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I've got good news for you today. Verse 24 says, Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you're here today, is this okay, Pastor Rod? Or is that okay for you? Now, Romans 1, 14 to 16, Paul the Apostle, right, he never, he never really visited Rome. 
But he was so pumped and so excited about this heathenistic, Hellenistic <laughs> culture. He was steeped in philosophy. They were the ooh, lightened ones and smart and intelligent. But he speaks about the barbarics. They were the unwise, <laughs> non-Hellenistic, non-thinking, uncultured people <laughs> that were rude and rough and harsh. He says, I'm a debtor to them. He says, as much as is in me, I'm ready to preach the gospel in Rome. As much as in me today, I'm ready to preach the gospel in Caloundra. Come on, I'll tell you why. Because verse 16 says, because I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. <laughs> why? Because it's the power of God that's going to save you today. If you're not saved, if you don't know Jesus... Close your eyes right now. Is this okay, Pastor Rod? Close your eyes now. If you don't know Jesus today, you may have been brought up in church. Doesn't mean you know Jesus. You may have thought that church was for good people. Well, yeah, we do good things, but it wasn't for good people. <laughs> it was for sinners to be made right with God. If you're here today... And you know that I'm speaking to you. I want to let you know something. The Father has wide open arms for you right now. He's running towards you. He has loved you with an everlasting love. If there's any person here and you've never given your heart to Jesus, even if you've been to church but you've never given your heart, you've never entered a relationship with Jesus, lift up your hand right now. Come on, lift it up. Anyone here? You've never given your heart to Jesus. I'd love to meet you. I'd love to pray for you. Come on, the same Jesus that set me free is the same Jesus that can come into your life today. <laughs> or you may be here and you're distant and you're discouraged and you're disappointed with your journey so far. If you're here and you want to recommit and say, Lord, I'm ready to get on fire for Jesus. I'm ready to be set aflame for the gospel. I'm ready to give all that I can to you, Lord. We trust you've enjoyed the ministry of the word. And if you'd like more details or how to contact our church and its resources, look at our website, www.churchontherise.org.au.